Hello, my name's Joel Dunning. I'm here at EACS 2023 and I'm absolutely delighted to uh, have Professor Hans-Joachim Schaefers. Uh, it's such a delight to have you here. Uh, I think you're known to virtually everybody in, in our audience. Uh, obviously, uh, you're in Saarland University Hospital in Hamburg, uh, the absolute godfather of aortic repair, amazing uh, Ross procedure surgeon and so much more. Uh, you hold so many courses. And what we really want to hear from you today is what you have been doing here at EACS. You've been doing doing several things, uh, you've been doing your tip repair, but, but I think let's start with, with one of the talks you've been giving is in the Ross Repair, what do you do with that pulmonary autograph that starts to fail? It, yes, well, um, that topic deals with two aspects. One is uh, we want to prevent failure, we want to do our best to prevent the failure, and, and this is where different surgeons have come up with different concepts. Um, I um, both used um, autologous tissue, aortic tissue, actually, in, in my concept that I came up with 18 years ago to stabilize the autograft all the way around. And that has been very effective in minimizing autograft failure. However, if it occurs, um, the easy way out would be to replace the aortic valve. Um, that's, for us, the easy way out not always the best solution for the patient. So here it's, it's, it would be ideal if we could preserve as many of these autograph valves as possible. Uh, the good thing about aortic repair is it teaches you more about aortic valve geometry and you can use um, the concepts of aortic repair to preserve a failed autograft valve in the majority of cases with a good stability. And this, of course, is ideal to, to the patient. He can still have the benefits, the long-term benefits of the um, autologous valve. So, so really the message is if, if you're getting a failing pulmonary valve, go in as if it was an aortic valve exactly. uh, regurgitating. Use your principles for repair in that, the same cusp heights, you know, do everything. Is there anything in particular that you find different? Are they thinner? Are they uh, no, different? No, the, the structure, the valve adapts to the circulation. So actually, if you go in beyond the first three to six months, um, I rarely go in that early or I have to go back in but the valve looks like a normal aortic valve. Um, but you have to be uh, ready to, um, to find pathologies that you would also find in aortic valves. There will be cusp prolapse, there sometimes, and this is, this is rare, but it has to be recognized, there may be cusp retraction or cusp hypoplasia. And this, of course, should ideally be recognized at the time of the ROS. Um, now, if you work on the field trials, um, then you have to define what can you repair and what should better not be repaired. And this is where we simply apply the principles of aortic repair. So can you actually see sometimes in the first operation a slightly thickened pulmonary valve that might lend itself to hyperplasia or...? No, it's, it's not really... Um, and, and this is where I've had my own learning curve. It's not really thickened tissue, that's so obvious. Uh, things are more subtle. Circumferential orientation of the commissures may vary. The geometric height, the amount of tissue that each of the three cusps that exist may vary. And, um, and yes, certain treatments like um, radiation or the presence of rheumatic heart valve disease may change this and may lead to cusp retraction and then you want to make certain you have enough cusp tissue before you actually go in and use this pulmonary valve now as the yacht. So if we, if we move on to another session you've just chaired, it's all about the science of aortic valve repair. Maybe let's just start uh, with that and what you were discussing in that session uh, and, and, and where, where you think we are today with the science of aortic valve repair. Um, we have learned a lot in the last 15 to 20 years, but we are still learning. And maybe the most, uh, the most fascinating study was a cooperative study between Tel Aviv, Rome and Hamburg, where we uh, did computer simulation 
on aortic valves uh, with a given cusp size and then simply stepwise modified annular size, sinotubular size and looked at the effects on aortic valve configuration and also stresses. And this clearly showed that annular stabilization is important. It gives us this, and, and if it, if or when it comes out in the European Journal, uh, mm. it, it will also give surgeons who, who simply look at the paper, who look at the tables, it will give them an idea. Okay, I have a geometry type X. <clears throat> I should modify my annular and sinotubular uh, diameter to, to such and such a size in order to have a predictable valve function. Mm -hmm. And and so one one other thing that you are you'll be presenting on is a really fascinating session of not just tricuspid aortic valve repair, but you're talking about bicuspid, and you're actually personally presenting on a super rare unicuspid aortic valve repair. That like blew my mind. It's like we can repair these as well, and uh, uh, I guess these are the most difficult things to repair. But uh, I I fully agree. But but we need to keep in mind what patients this is about. Unicuspid aortic valves uh, is. That's pediatric patients. Uh, congenital aortic stenosis equals unicuspidity. And um, some of these patients will come at the age of 15 or 20 or 25, sometimes older, uh, with either regurgitation, stenosis, mixed lesions, whatever. Now, the problem is if, if you have the pediatric and, uh, age group, um, mechanical will not be a good solution. Biologic, of course. The Ross operation means if we put in a small homograft, they will have to be reoperated. And there is a nice study published by uh, Pascal Bouhet and his group in the JTCVS showing that there is a relevant incidence of reoperation uh, following the Ross operation if it's done at pediatric age group. And this is the charm of the unicuspid repair where using uh, pericardial patches, we create a second commissure, simply augment the cusp tissue uh, and create a symmetric bicuspid uh, belt. Um, an operation that I have found reproducible. It has the advantage over an Ozaki that two thirds of the cusp, two thirds of the belt are still autologous, are still native. So we don't rely fully on patch material and um, over time now um, a number of centers also in North America are using that. Um, just recently a publication came out of uh, Boston, Sick Children's, um, who adopted that approach for the obvious advantages. I know Montreal and a few other centers are using that and the purpose is not to create a lifelong solution but to let the patient grow, um, to do a ROS at of adolescence or maybe as a young adult uh, means you can choose conduits that will not become too small, will not be outgrown by the patient, and it, it will be a low risk procedure compared to an infant ROS, which still has relevant morbidity and mortality. Yeah, fascinating, absolutely. So if we move on a little bit, you, you hold a regular course uh, in aortic valve repair every year. It's a three-day course. It's absolutely fantastic. I, I'm sure lots of people watching this video will be thinking, well, you know, I'd love to, to, to learn what on earth's on that course and things. So how, how do you teach people new to aortic valve repair through the steps? Yes. And, uh, now, there was one in the introduction you said from Hamburg. It's not Hamburg, it's Homburg. Sorry, sorry. No, it's okay. Damn British people. And, <laughs> and uh, I used to hold the courses. Um, I will now leave my institution as my term is over. Uh, and for that reason, I cannot hold the courses uh, anymore. Um, in the, the courses were actually very tough for the participants. Um, the best compliments I heard were um, by participants. I feel like back in medical school and uh, being, being challenged uh, mentally all the time. These courses consisted of ex lectures explaining the principles, then some wet lab practice, 
and importantly, live surgery, but also video presentations, edited videos in order to show examples of specific procedures. Now in order, not everybody can come to the course. Uh, and three days absence, um, the amount of uh, time, money and whatever invested, uh, that's not for everybody. Actually three years, three, four years ago, I tried to put together the core content of the course in a video book, um, which has helped a number of surgeons. I remember this young colleague from San Francisco last year who um, bought the video book and, and then some other recordings. And then w without coming to a course, he started aortic repair and she started successfully and only came by for a week or so this year in order to refresh his memory and maybe see some additional details. So uh, that apparently seems to be um, very helpful to surgeons who want to either start or improve their practice. Yeah, and I've actually had the opportunity to see this amazing online now course. Uh, it looks absolutely brilliant. You've got introductory videos, you've got actual echoes, actual operating, super stable camera, better view than an actual surgeon. They were really amazing and hints and tips and tricks. So maybe tell us a few things about what can be found on this and tell us a little bit about where people can find this course. Well, um, what is, why is mitral repair routine? Uh, and this is where Alain Carpentier made a big contribution 40, 50 years ago. Not necessarily because of technical details, but because of the philosophy behind mitral repair. And this philosophy, adopting that philosophy, then made mitral repair reproducible. The same thing applies to aortic repair. It just, the philosophy has some similarities, but it also has some different aspects. So. I, for the surgeon, it's important not only to see what is done during an operation, but also to understand why it is done, why it is necessary. So um, I've, I've taken my standard lectures from the course, introduction and the concept of modular uh, approach to aortic repair. Um, and then as an addition, uh, tricuspid, bicuspid, unicuspid, quadricuspid valves, they not only look different, but they require different concepts. So this is what I've tried to explain the differences. And then there are 20 examples, uh, edited video examples of repair procedures that show the important technical details. And, um, and we will, we agree that um, the, um, the videos um, or the presentations, how to start root repair, how to start cusp repair, should be made um, available on CTSnet, simply in, in order to help other surgeons in this important decision process. Who do I repair? What do I do? Yeah, I mean, this just sounds like the most fantastic opportunity for people. You know, if they thinking about where, how am I going to do my first aortic repair? You know, this is a great course, and uh, and and we certainly at CTSnet are going to sort of profile a couple of the videos on it, and then and then we will bring up the website uh, that uh, I believe is is uh, www.care saar.com and uh, and actually they'll be able to see the full set of videos and, and and you're actually saying that you have had surgeons that on the basis of that they've actually been able to start aortic repair in their practice absolutely so. just uh, just a couple of months ago uh, i had a surgeon contacting me from uh, northern ireland she said i have this patient she sent me the uh, the short axis and long axis echo views and i and i told her go ahead and she said, I don't know, should I? Yeah. And I said, look, look at the respective part of the video book, go ahead. 24 hours later, I received the email, I did it, everything was fine. Easy. That's amazing. And, and I guess that there's an amazing point, you know, if, if somebody's out there wondering whether to repair or not, can they contact you directly? You know, could they send you an echo and things? That would be Absolutely. wonderful. Absolutely. This yeah. is what I've done in the last years. There may be, um, there will be a change in my email address because I'm leaving the institution, but I'm always willing to 
help and of course give advice. Yeah, well that's absolutely an amazing service for the world. So well, thank you so much from uh, everyone really. So myself at CTSnet, but that just sounds like such a great resource, just like Alan Carpentier led for Mitral as you've led over the years in aortic repair. So, and thank you so much for your openness for the course and also for just helping surgeons around the world in it. So that's absolutely thank you, great. Thank you very much. Thank you.